Hey guys, it's Slumming Rush. Merry Christmas. Today, I have a video for you of Alchemist Warrior. He's, I think he's a Polish player. I think that's the language he's speaking on the EU server, and he's in his E75. Now, Alchemist is kind of just above average. He's got like 1,500 recent win rate and about 50% recent win rate. So his play isn't perfect, but I haven't actually seen a whole lot. Uh, no one plays the E75 anymore. At least no one good plays the E75 anymore. And uh, well, I think it's actually... it. After seeing him play, it looks like a solid tank. So he's on the map mines. He actually starts off by being AFK. This I doubt it's because his computer's bad or anything like that. Sometimes I've I've seen people will sit in base to look at where the team's going. And if he, that's the case, what he's done is he's seen where his team's going, if this is what he's doing. And most of them have gone to here and over to the one line. And basically, he's decided to run into the rock over there. <laughs> the bottom line is I think he's gone to the weak side to try to help that out. Okay, now before we get into the action of this replay, I need to thank Raid Shadow Legends once again for sponsoring this video. Raid Shadow Legends is a triple A quality game that fits right into your pocket. With over 500 champions to collect, each with their own skill trees and millions of artifacts to find and equip, no two champions will ever be the same. If you're going to play Raid Shadow Legends, the way I would suggest doing it is literally play it for the story mode. It's got to be one of the most appealing parts of the game for me. Dungeons and the story mode, when you're waiting for something to happen and you've got like 5 or 10 minutes, literally it's, it's the best way to pass the time. So, can't recommend them enough. If you're gonna play the game, check those out first. This month, Raid Shadow Legends released their biggest update ever. The main event is the Doom Tower. It's a giant tower with 120 floors, a bunch of secret challenge rooms, and 12 bosses that you get to take on. On top of that, they're also releasing 14 new champions and a whole host of holiday events and tournaments. There's really never been a better time to start playing. The raid team are giving away a bunch of new free goodies and a special champion to help get you started on the new tower. The Bulwark champion is absolutely awesome in Clan Boss, and he's also going to be a huge help in the Doom Tower. If you want to get a head start in Raid Shadow Legends, all you have to do is hit the link in the description and you'll get a free Void Champion Bulwark, 50 gems, an XP booster, some energy refills, and an Ancient Shard as soon as you get in-game. All this treasure will be waiting for you here after you sign up with the link down below. So he comes over to here. The enemy team is very weak in the mid, but they have a T30 over there. And in front of him, he's got an AMX M445, T10 Bizante, and another Bizante, and uh, a Mausch. Basically, he's got the entire enemy team in front of him. And his mid is, uh, well, should be very supported by TDs, and he's fine. So first shot of the game is on a Bizante. He's from this flank right here. He's got an AMX right behind him, who's kind of blocking him, but he's going to just change the angle and it should be fine. And now there's an IS-2 and a T10. Now, as these guys push through, you can see this is happening. He's actually just sitting here. I have uh, <laughs> no idea why. I, the reason I'm showing this is not because of his AFKing on corners. He's actually positionally very strong right here. So even though he's not the strongest of players, and you can just straight up see it in how he's playing, what he's done is he's positioned himself really nicely. He's in really good spot to shoot people pushing into him. And if you also look at what he's got behind him, he's literally got three tank destroyers back here. And what you'll find is on, on this map right here is if you take a position like this where Alchemist warrior is he should have a very easy time dealing with the t10 no matter how good he is because he's got three tank destroyers behind him now if you've been watching the map he's lost the mid that happened way faster than i could could have ever guessed but you can see his team's actually down four tanks and he's got a t10 in front of him so he takes the shot goes in the t10 bounces that's great and then from here he's got a bison i i don't know how to say it i'll just call it a bison because that's how i assume he's got a bison and shit in front of him and uh well he takes an easy hit from the eyes too by just sitting in the corner definitely would not advise that but in general the position is good so he pokes out bounces a shot gets penned by the is2 uh he bounced the t10 shot right there and he's able to put the shot into one of them that's the is2 i think that he penned and now he's got these three tanks right here and he's able to just basically poke out once again and this one you know these tanks are fairly easy to pen they're not exactly armored russian heavies in front of him. So this guy's side scraping kind of badly. He's able to put the shot in. The German accuracy typically won't do that reliably, but that shot goes in. He's up to 2600 damage. Despite being shot twice and penned twice, I believe at this point, he's only lost about you know, 500 HP. So he's got 1300 HP and uh, he's going to need it because he's about to get flanked. There's a Barask pushing in behind him, a T30 and an ISU. So pokes out, Falls back in time, the T10 misses his shots. So that was actually pretty solid of him. The way to deal with this, in my opinion, is just to kind of camp the angle. You know the T10's reloading, and that's exactly what he does. He pulls out, and then he... <laughs> He then gives it up to side scrape. I don't think this makes much sense. He could have just sat there, but you can see the T10's waiting for it. He puts a shot into the T10. T10 doesn't return one into him. And, you know, obviously side scraping off of this corner is a lot better because he's able to hide his lower plate. Now, at this point, it seems he's noticed that he's getting flanked. There's the 
one shot T30 behind him of full HP TD. And you can see that T10 behind him is starting to kind of YOLO basically. So he's going to wait for the shot. He zooms in way too much. He's not able to lead it, but he notices the T10 in time uh, from here. It's a very easy shot in the T10 if he decides to push, but you can see the TDs, the ISU-152K just killed the T10. And so, you know, if that guy tries, if anyone in his position tries to push in, it should be very easy for the ISU, the Tiger, and the SU-130 to do damage to him. Also, by being here, he's perma-spotting the Bizonte, which at this point in time actually matters. It's going to give him a huge advantage. So, from this point, he's got the T30 here. Now, this T30 position is very strong because the T30, where these guys are cannot get shot by these tank destroyers back here so the position the enemy team is actually kind of in a better position than alchemist warrior is right here and so you can see by by sitting here he's engaging these players alone it's to his advantage not to poke on these players so he pokes on the isu the s scorpion and potentially the t30 luckily only the isu pens him and he finds out immediately that, that that's not worth it he's got the is2 behind him his platoon mates trying to deal with that shit and he's going to repoke right or it looks like he's going to repoke right here i don't think this is the brightest He's got a solid bush in front of him. He's never really going to spot these guys, and you can see they did spot him first. Puts the shot into the Scorpion. Luckily, that guy bounces. There's still that T30 right there. And we know there's the ISU-152K because he just shot him. Unfortunately, we can't spot him just yet. So once he's loaded, he's going to poke out again. Now, I, I kind of think the way to do this is to be cautious about it. Obviously, so if the enemy got up to here... It wouldn't be great, but to me, he can side scrape, and that would be a better way of dealing with it. And you can see he's starting to side scrape right here, and that's actually going to give him like a reasonable advantage over these TDs who are just sitting there waiting for him to poke. So tries to side scrape, he gets lit. Fair enough. There's a bison on top of him. Basically, if his teammates can shoot him, that's great. Bison's not worried about Alchemist Warrior in this position. Obviously, if the bison were to try to drop on him, that would change things a lot. But he does have the two tanks behind him who should be able to help him. He pokes out again. He's lit right now. So this is very risky. And you can see they're both... One of them was ready for it. The other wasn't. He is able to kill the ISU. And by being passive here... This is probably not on purpose, I'm just going to be honest, but this is what's happening. By being passive in this position, the enemy's getting impatient. They're pushing into a crossfire between Alchemist Warrior and all the tank destroyers back here. So if you ever find yourself in this position, just let the enemies come into you because it gives your Yag, Tiger, and SU-130 behind really easy shots. Now, here he thinks it's a good idea to poke on a hull down SU-130. At this point, this fight makes no sense, except for the fact that the T-30 is reloading. So he knows he's going to beat the T-30's reload. He's got 614 HP. He can kind of brawl with the uh, scorpion because if the, the scorpion would have to high roll I think to maybe kill him it's unlikely though but now you can see he's loaded looks like the T30 is loaded as well because the T30 is aiming on him his best play is once again just to continue to be patient and try to let his IS-32 or his TDs or whatever like work for him he's in no rush right here he's got the support now in this position, you can see he's actually doing a really good job. I don't like how he's turning his turrets so much. <laughs> if I was mentoring him, I'd be saying something about it. Basically, the, the way to do this is just point your turret at the corner and hold right-click so your turret doesn't move. That that would be a lot smarter than pointing your gun into a rock or even pointing the side of your turret out here. So it is what it is. He's not dead, but he could be if he got unlucky right here. So T30 is still there. That's no surprise. He did get lit in this position. You can see that guy clearly... It's, it's too dangerous, really, for the T-30 to push up. So from his perspective, Alchemist Warrior literally just has to camp here. We also know the T-30 is probably shooting gold. Uh, you would just expect it from a T-30 uh, being a one-shot in his position. He needs his shots to pen to win the game. So even if you didn't know that the guy was shooting gold, you should expect it in an E-75. You shouldn't be taking taking gambles like that it's not like you have the most reliable armor against tier 9 tds so t30 starts to fall back that might create an opportunity for a shot and you can see alchemist starts to push out he's looking for shots gets hit by the scorpion g luckily the guy is shooting he but that he shot makes it really easy for him to hit he takes the blind shot and ignores the t30 crossing i i think the blind shot was fine to take but i don't think it was likely in most cases the su1 the scorpion g would have kind of fallen back after shooting just in case he got lit but there you go so the su-130 in the back manages to kill the guy his yag tiger's dead he's only got the su-130 supporting him and he's now basically a, a high roll for the scorpion g so poking out on the scorpion g like this is okay the way to do it is to poke your turret out fall back before he can reload wait three seconds and see if your sixth sense went off and you can see 
all these bushes here are giving the Scorpion G the advantage in this situation. So how do you deal with it? Well, <laughs> you basically have to hope the Scorpion G isn't a great player because if he makes a mistake, it's kind of the only way. Um, and because he lost 100 HP up to this point, it's not really intelligent to take any risks. They also have a Barask who's probably on the hill. They've got a Pershing of 430. Those are the only tanks left alive. So he pokes out and you can see he's just sitting here. That lets the Scorpion G shoot him, but he's able to spot the SKG. Now the SKG is on 617 HP, this is where you would actually load HE, and I would totally advise HE in this situation, because even if you had a 100 damage HE shot, you would two-shot the Scorpion G, right? So it's it's very likely for the... HE would be the better shell choice here. Now, he's driving up. This is actually okay because the Scorpion G won't really be prepared for it, and he's basically negating the Scorpion G's advantage. Pokes up to here, and you can see the Scorpion G kind of has gun depression issues. Like, clearly, he won't have a very good shot on Alchemist Warrior right here. So he just really aims the shot as the Scorpion G makes it easier. He puts the shot into him with HE that would have gone in, and now he has to hope that the Scorpion G is either misses with HE or bounces with AP, and he ended up missing with HE. So, worked out for him. He should beat the Scorpion's reload. Quick look at the map tells you the Brask is not on the hill. He's an A9, so this push makes perfect sense. He's able to pick up the kill on the Scorpion G, and then from here, <laughs> quick look at the map again, there's now an Object 430 on the hill. Now, that 430 wants to kill Alchemist Warrior here. And as you drive up this ramp, especially if you were to come around these tanks, you give the Object 430 really easy shots on you. So what he's doing is he's falling back. This is the right play. You open yourself up to being cliff dived by the 430 right here, but you know, he's got an IS-32 over here. He needs to support the guy. This is ultimately the best position, keeping the 430 permalit, supporting the IS-32. This is this is where you'd actually want to be right here. Now, you can see the 430 is falling back. Now, that's going to create a bit of an opportunity because once Alchemist Warrior goes dark, he's not dark yet, <laughs> as he was spotted moving. He, he, he only moved when he was spotted. Now that he got dark, he fell back. I think if he had simply stayed here, waited to go dark, and then pushed the hill or something like that, he might have been able to make it work, especially if the guard had come with him. You can see the 430 probably kind of expects someone to be pushing the hill right here because of the play he made, but the guard is following him up, so Alchemist Warrior's deciding to take the hill. Now, behind him, he's got the guard. The guard's got way more HP. Alchemist Warrior doesn't give a shit. He's just going to drive around. He's aiming this okay. Um, the 430 is typically going to be held down in this position anyway, so there's not really a whole lot you can do. Obviously, he's hiding his lower plate reasonably well by climbing up the hill like he is, and the guard just doesn't give two shits. He's yoloing into the 430. He misses his shot. The 430 misses his shot as well. And, uh, well, Alchemist Warrior is only left with one option right here, and that's to push in. Now, looking at the map, because I'm going to do this, I, <laughs> you don't need to watch the 430 die. It's irrelevant. Where do you think the Barask is, because you've got a platoon mate pushing down the zero line, where the hell could the Barask be? Well, the best position for the Barask would have been to come up here and obviously flank Alchemist Warrior. Now, from the information he had, uh, he's probably, like in nine times out of ten, you'd expect him to be somewhere back here or somewhere back here. This is going to be the best play for him. If he was trying to break the camp, he'd go to the one line and try to push that side um, because he already had a teammate on the hill. But if he was trying to flank Alchemist Warrior, his best play would be to come from here, from here, or wherever the hell he is, and just YOLO in, kill the tanks on the hill, and try to help out his 430. Now, that's not exactly what's happening. You can watch the map after he gets the kill on the 430, Alchemist Warrior hasn't realized this clearly, but you know that that would be the issue right here. So we don't know where the Barask is. Alchemist Warrior's done 5k damage. He's just kind of trundling up the hill right here, and his platoon mate is basically storming into the cap. Now, platoon mate's not dead, so it kind of implies the Barask is not in the strongest position on the map, which would be here given given the circumstances. And so the is 3 is not dead, so he's not there. Aiming back here um, doesn't make much sense. Now, because his platoon mate hasn't spotted anything, that's great. He's uh, now aiming at a random bush. I really don't know. If I were to guess where this guy would be, I would say K5 or behind the buildings in K9. You never know like who you're dealing with unless you have XVM. So it's very possible. He's just sitting right here telling his teammates to cap. That's the red ID. He's got an SG-130 pushing through the middle of the map, and that guy spots the Barask. So the Barask probably went over to the one line to try to break what he perceived was a camp, and it definitely was a camp. His idea might have been to push the one line, kill the guard, get behind the E-75, and so on and so forth. Would have been a really reasonable position. Now, Alchemist Story is just sitting here. <laughs> It's not even angling. Doesn't give a shit. Um, the Barask will have the camo in this situation to outspot the E75, especially if he has Binox or something, which is actually pretty common on the EU server and even on the NA server. So it's uh, it's possible that he gets lit right here, even without shooting. <laughs> and uh, this angling, I, I don't think it's the brightest, not going to lie. So there you go. He gets lit. The
the Brask misses his shot or bounces or whatever. Super lucky because he could have died right here. The SU-130 picks up the kill. And uh, ultimately, that was not a purposefully played game, but I thought it was really solid in result. And, you know, y you could be a much better player and abuse this position way more successfully than Alchemist Warrior did. Or you could be an average player just like he is and have uh, probably similar results. So let's go take a look at the end plates and we'll go from there. So the E75 is a very unpopular tank. And that replay was actually really well played. You would kind of expect it to be a Mastery Badge first class on any other tier 9. But, you know, no one plays the E75. So there you go. It's a Mastery Badge, high caliber, steel wall. Brothers in Arms, I can't say it was amazingly played because I don't think it was, but he had an amazing result. 5,561 damage, 3 kills, 14 shots fired, 12 of them hit and penned. He ended up doing 2,770 blocked damage, 2,285 spotting, and you can see his position was very strong all around. He got a lot of spotting, he got a lot of damage, and, you know, anyone can actually, like, he made so many mistakes that, uh, you know, whoever's watching this can totally go home and try this play. So, <laughs> yeah, that's the video. If you want to see more, be sure to hit the like and the subscribe button, and I hope to see you around. Later, guys. Bye-bye.